My name is Robert Bennett, and I am 68 years old. This happened to me on October 18th, 2012. They said becoming a cop would toughen me up. I'd been soft, they said, a mama's boy. I thought about mama while I sat in my patrol car, air conditioning blasting, watching a cloud of gnats swarm around a dead squirrel in the ditch. Damn roadkill. My stomach growled. I checked my watch. Almost lunchtime. I could go for a burger, maybe fries. The radio crackled. Unit 23. Respond to a call at Henderson's Feed and Seed. Possible break-in. Henderson's. Old man Henderson was a pain in the ass. Always calling about kids stealing his fertilizer or some nonsense. I sighed and put the car in gear. So much for lunch. Henderson's was a dusty old building on the edge of town, crammed with bags of feed, tools, and enough insecticide to wipe out a small country. Old man Henderson stood outside, a wiry figure with a face like a dried prune. About time, he rasped. Damn kids broke in again, stole my best rat poison. I followed him inside. The place smelled of dust and mildew. A window at the back was broken. See, Henderson said, pointing a gnarled finger. They came in through there. I examined the window. No footprints, no fingerprints. Odd. You sure it wasn't just the wind, Mr. Henderson? He snorted. Wind don't steal rat poison, Sonny. I spent the next hour checking the place, finding nothing. I was about to leave when I noticed something. A small, dark stain on the floor near the broken window. It looked almost like... Mr. Henderson, you got any animals around here? Just a few stray cats, why? I crouched down, sniffing the stain. It was faint, but unmistakable. Blood. Call animal control, I said. Tell them you might have a dead animal somewhere. Henderson grumbled, but went to make the call. I followed the trail of blood leading away from the window towards the back of the store. It stopped at a large metal feed bin. The lid was slightly ajar. I grabbed a crowbar from a nearby shelf and slowly lifted the lid. Inside, nestled amongst the grain, was a human hand. The hand was small, pale, and severed cleanly at the wrist. It looked like it belonged to a woman. My heart hammered in my chest. This wasn't some kid's prank. This was something much worse. I backed away from the bin, my mind racing. Who did the hand belong to? How did it get here? And where was the rest of the body? Henderson returned, looking annoyed. Animal control said they're swamped. We got bigger problems than a dead cat, Mr. Henderson, I said, my voice tight. Call the sheriff. Tell him we need backup. The next few hours were a blur. The sheriff arrived with a team of deputies. They cordoned off the area, took photos, and bagged the hand as evidence. I answered their questions, trying to recall every detail. The news of the discovery spread like wildfire through our small town. People were scared. Whispers of a serial killer started circulating. I couldn't blame them. A severed hand in a feed bin wasn't exactly a common occurrence. The hand was sent to the state crime lab for analysis. They identified it as belonging to a young woman, early 20s, name unknown. No match was found in any missing persons database. It was like she'd appeared out of thin air, only to disappear just as quickly. Days turned into weeks. The investigation stalled. We had no leads, no suspects, nothing. The town remained on edge, the fear palpable. I couldn't sleep. The image of that pale hand lying amongst the grain haunted my dreams. One night I was working the late shift patrolling the quiet streets. The radio was silent, the only sound the hum of the engine and the occasional chirp of crickets. I passed by Henderson's, the building dark and ominous. A shiver ran down my spine. Suddenly a call came over the radio. Unit 23, respond to a disturbance at the old Miller place. The old Miller place was an abandoned farmhouse on the outskirts of town. It had been empty for years, a local legend claiming it was haunted. I turned the car around and headed towards the farmhouse. As I pulled up, I saw a figure running away from the house, disappearing into the darkness. I grabbed my flashlight and gun, approaching the house cautiously. The front door was hanging open, creaking in the wind. I stepped inside, my flashlight cutting through the darkness. The air was thick with dust and the smell of decay. I moved slowly, checking each room. In the kitchen I found it. 
a woman lying on the floor, her eyes wide with terror. Her throat was slashed, blood pooling around her body. She was dead. I knelt beside her, checking for a pulse, though I knew it was futile. She was young, maybe in her early twenties. Same age as the hand we found. A cold feeling settled in my gut. This was the work of the same person, I was sure of it. But who and why? I stood up, scanning the room. My flashlight beam landed on something near the woman's body. It was a small metal object. I picked it up. It was a rat poison container the same brand that Henderson had reported stolen. A sudden noise made me whirl around. I aimed my flashlight towards the sound. There, standing in the doorway, was a figure. It was tall and thin with long, dark hair that obscured its face. It wore a tattered black coat, its arms hanging limply at its sides. I raised my gun, my finger tightening on the trigger. Don't move, I yelled. The figure didn't respond. It just stood there, watching me with an eerie stillness. Who are you? I demanded. What do you want? Silence. I took a step closer, my gun trained on the figure. I said, who are you? The figure slowly raised its head, its hair falling away to reveal its face. It was a face I would never forget. A face that would haunt my nightmares for years to come. It was the face of a monster. Its skin was pale and stretched tight over its bones, giving it a skeletal appearance. Its eyes were sunken, its nose a flattened nub, and its mouth a lipless gash filled with rows of needle-like teeth. The creature took a step towards me. I could smell its foul breath, a mix of rotting flesh and something else, something sickly sweet. I fired. The bullet hit the creature in the chest, but it didn't even flinch. It kept coming, its eyes fixed on me. I fired again and again, but the bullets had no effect. I was out of ammo. I dropped the gun and backed away my heart pounding in my chest. The creature lunged, its long, skeletal fingers reaching for my throat. I stumbled back, tripping over a chair. I fell to the floor, helpless. The creature loomed over me, its rancid breath hot on my face. I closed my eyes, waiting for the end, but it never came. Instead, I heard a loud, guttural roar, followed by a series of heavy thuds. I opened my eyes to see the creature backing away, its attention diverted. Standing in the doorway was Sheriff Daniels, his shotgun aimed at the creature. He fired, the blast hitting the creature in the shoulder. It roared again, this time in pain, and stumbled back. Daniels fired again, hitting the creature in the leg. It fell to the floor, writhing in agony. Get out of here, Bennett, Daniels yelled. I got this. I scrambled to my feet and ran out of the house. I didn't stop running until I reached my patrol car. I jumped in, slammed the door, and locked it. I sat there, gasping for breath, my body trembling. I looked back at the farmhouse. The windows were dark, the only sound, the chirping of crickets. What the hell had I just witnessed? Sheriff Daniels emerged from the house a few minutes later. He walked over to my car, his face pale and drawn. You okay? He asked. I nodded, unable to speak. That thing, what was it? I finally managed to croak out. Daniels shook his head. I don't know. Never seen anything like it. He looked back at the farmhouse. It's dead. Two shots to the head. It's over. But was it? The image of that monstrous face, the smell of its breath, the feeling of its cold, skeletal fingers on my skin. It was all burned into my memory. I knew I would never be the same. The next few days were a whirlwind. The news of the creature and the murder spread like wildfire. Reporters descended upon our small town, eager for a story. I was interviewed, questioned, and examined. I told them everything I saw, everything I remembered. They found the creature's body in the farmhouse, along with the remains of several other victims. It seemed the creature had been using the abandoned farmhouse as its lair, preying on unsuspecting victims. The investigation revealed that the creature was not human. It was something else, something not of this world. The scientists and experts were baffled. They had never encountered anything like it before. They couldn't explain where it came from or how it got here. They couldn't even give it a name. But the people of our town, they had a name for it. They called it the Skinwalker. They said it was a creature from Native American legend, a shapeshifter that could take on the form of any animal. They said it was evil, a bringer of death and destruction. I didn't know much about Native American legends, but I knew one thing for sure. That creature, whatever it was, was pure evil. 
and it was dead. The town slowly returned to normal. People started to feel safe again. The fear subsided, replaced by a sense of relief. But for me, the nightmare wasn't over. I still saw that face in my dreams. I still felt the cold touch of its fingers on my skin. I left the police force a few months later. I couldn't take it anymore. I needed to get away, to start over. I moved to a different state, a different town. I tried to forget what happened, but I knew I never would. I still think about the victims, the women who lost their lives to that monster. I think about the hand in the feed bin, the woman in the farmhouse. I think about their families, their friends, the lives that were shattered. And I think about the creature, the skinwalker. I wonder where it came from, what it was, why it did what it did. I'll never know the answers. But one thing I do know, the world is a darker, more dangerous place than I ever imagined. And there are things out there, lurking in the shadows, that we can't even begin to understand. Years have passed since that fateful night, but the memories remain as vivid as ever. I've tried to move on, to build a new life, but the shadows of the past still cling to me. I've become somewhat of a recluse, preferring the safety of my small apartment to the unpredictability of the outside world. My neighbors probably think I'm just a cranky old man, and maybe they're right, but they don't know what I've seen, what I've been through. Sometimes, on quiet nights when the wind howls and the trees cast long shadows, I find myself back in that farmhouse. I can smell the musty air, feel the cold dread creeping up my spine. I see the creature's face, its lifeless eyes boring into my soul. In those moments, I have to remind myself that it's over, that the monster is dead. But is it really? I've done my research over the years, delving into folklore and myths from around the world. The more I learn, the more I realize how little we truly know about the world we live in. There are stories, whispers of creatures that defy explanation, of things that shouldn't exist but do. And they're not just in small towns like mine. They're everywhere, hiding in plain sight, waiting. I've tried to warn people to share what I know. But most just laugh it off or look at me with pity in their eyes. They think I'm crazy, traumatized by what happened, maybe I am. But I know what I saw, what I experienced. And I know that there are others out there who have seen similar things, who have faced the darkness and lived to tell the tale. I've connected with some of them online in forums and chat rooms dedicated to the unexplained. We share our stories, our theories, our fears. It's a small comfort knowing I'm not alone. But it's also terrifying realizing just how many encounters there have been, how many creatures are out there. One story in particular has stuck with me. It came from a woman in Arizona, a former park ranger. She described a creature similar to what I saw, but with subtle differences. It was taller, she said, with elongated limbs and a face that seemed to shift and change as you looked at it. She encountered it deep in the desert, in an area known for strange disappearances. Her description sent chills down my spine. Could it be the same creature? Or was there more than one? The thought keeps me up at night, wondering if what we faced in that small town was just the tip of the iceberg. How many more are out there? And what do they want? I've tried to find answers to make sense of it all. I've pored over ancient texts, spoken to experts in cryptozoology and paranormal phenomena. But the more I learn, the more questions I have. It's like trying to solve a puzzle with half the pieces missing. There are theories, of course. Some say these creatures are interdimensional beings slipping through cracks in reality. Others believe they're the result of secret government experiments gone wrong. And then there are those who think they're as old as time itself, primordial beings that have always existed alongside us, hidden in the shadows. I don't know what to believe anymore. All I know is that the world is not what we think it is. There are forces at work beyond our understanding, Creatures that defy explanation. And they're out there, watching, waiting. Sometimes I wonder if I should have done more that night. Could I have saved more lives if I had acted differently? The guilt eats away at me, a constant companion in my solitude. But then I remember the creature's face, its inhuman strength, and I know that I was lucky to survive at all. I've tried to move on, to forget. But how do you forget something like that? 
How do you go back to a normal life when you've seen the impossible? The truth is, you can't. It changes you, fundamentally and irrevocably. You see the world differently. Every shadow holds a potential threat. Every unexplained sound, a possible danger. I've become hypervigilant, always watching, always listening. I've installed security cameras around my apartment, reinforced the locks on my doors and windows. It's probably overkill, but it helps me sleep at night. Well, as much as I can sleep these days, the nightmares are the worst. They come almost every night, vivid and terrifying. Sometimes I'm back in that farmhouse, reliving those moments of terror. Other times I'm running through endless dark forests, pursued by unseen creatures. I wake up drenched in sweat, my heart pounding, the echoes of inhuman screams ringing in my ears. I've tried therapy, medication, even hypnosis. Nothing seems to help. The memories, the fear, they're a part of me now. I've learned to live with them, but it's not easy. Some days are better than others. On the good days, I can almost pretend that everything is normal. I go for walks in the park, chat with the cashier at the local grocery store, watch mindless TV shows. But even then, there's always a part of me on alert, watching, waiting. On the bad days, I can barely bring myself to leave my apartment. The outside world feels too big, too dangerous. I spend hours poring over my research, trying to find some new piece of information that might help me make sense of it all. But the answers remain elusive. I often think about the other victims, the ones who didn't survive. The woman in the farmhouse, the owner of the severed hand. Who were they? Did they have families, loved ones who are still searching for answers? I've tried to find out, but the information is scarce. It's like they've been erased, their stories lost in the shadows. Sometimes I wonder if I should have gone public with what I know, but who would believe me? And even if they did, what good would it do? Would it bring back the dead? Would it erase the nightmares? Or would it just create more fear, more panic? No, I've decided it's better to keep what I know to myself, to carry this burden alone. Well, not entirely alone. There are others out there, like the woman from Arizona, who have seen things, who understand. We form a sort of support group, sharing our experiences, our fears, our theories. It helps, knowing I'm not crazy, that I'm not the only one who's faced the darkness and lived to tell the tale. But even with this support, the weight of what I've seen never truly leaves me. It's there in every decision I make, every interaction I have. I find myself studying people's faces, looking for signs of something inhuman lurking beneath the surface. It's exhausting, but I can't help it. Once you've seen behind the veil, there's no going back. I've tried to find purpose in my experiences. I've started writing down everything I remember, everything I've learned. It's not for publication, God knows what kind of attention that might attract. But as a record, a warning perhaps for future generations. Or maybe it's just for me, a way to exercise my demons by putting them down on paper. The writing helps in a way. It allows me to distance myself from the memories, to view them as a story rather than a lived experience. But it also forces me to confront details I've tried to forget to relive moments of terror I'd rather leave buried. One memory in particular haunts me more than the others. It's not the creature's face, or the moment I thought I was going to die. It's something that happened after, something I've never told anyone, not even my fellow survivors. It was a few days after the incident at the farmhouse. I was still on the force then, though I was on leave pending a psychological evaluation. I couldn't sleep, so I decided to take a drive, clear my head. Without really thinking about it, I found myself heading towards the old Miller place. The farmhouse was dark, abandoned once again now that the investigation was over. Yellow police tape fluttered in the breeze, a stark reminder of what had happened there. I sat in my car, staring at the building, my mind replaying the events of that night. That's when I saw it. A flicker of movement in one of the upstairs windows, just for a second but unmistakable, a face, pale and gaunt, peering out at me. I blinked and it was gone. I told myself it was just my imagination, my mind playing tricks on me. But deep down, I knew better. I never reported what I saw that night. I told myself it was because I didn't want to seem unstable, 
to jeopardize my career. But the truth is, I was scared. Scared of what it might mean. Scared of having to face that horror again. Now, years later, I often wonder about that face in the window. Was it really the creature, somehow still alive? Or was it something else entirely? Some other horror we hadn't even begun to understand? The questions haunt me, keeping me awake on long, dark nights. I've been back to that town a few times over the years, always telling myself it's to visit old friends or pay my respects to the victims. But I know the real reason. I'm drawn there, like a moth to a flame, searching for answers I'm not sure I want to find. The town has changed. New businesses have opened. Old ones have closed. The people seem happier, more relaxed. The events of that October have faded into local legend, a story to scare kids around campfires. But for those of us who were there, who saw what we saw, the scars remain. On my last visit, I drove past the old Miller place. The farmhouse is gone now, torn down to make way for a new housing development. Part of me is relieved. At least now, no one else will fall victim to whatever evil resided there. But another part of me feels like we've lost something important, like we've covered up evidence of a truth the world needs to know. As I get older, I find myself thinking more and more about what it all means. Why did this happen? Why our town? Why me? I don't have any answers, but I have theories. Maybe these creatures, these skinwalkers or whatever they are, have always been among us. Maybe they're drawn to certain places, certain people. Or maybe it's all random. A cosmic roll of the dice that happened to come up snake eyes for our little corner of the world. Whatever the reason, I know now that the world is a far stranger and more dangerous place than most people realize. There are things out there that defy explanation, that challenge everything we think we know about reality. And they're not going away. I don't know what the future holds. Will there be more encounters, more sightings? Will these creatures eventually reveal themselves to the world at large? Or will they continue to lurk in the shadows, picking off the unlucky few who stumble into their path? All I know is that I'll continue to watch, to listen, to piece together whatever scraps of information I can find. It's not much, but it's something. A candle in the darkness, a small act of defiance against the horrors that lurk just beyond our perception. And to anyone who might be reading this, anyone who's had their own brush with the unexplained, you're not alone. There are more of us out there than you might think. We've seen things we can't explain, faced horrors we can't understand, but we've survived. We carry the knowledge, the burden, the scars, and we keep going day by day, holding the line against the darkness, because in the end, that's all we can do. We can't unsee what we've seen, we can't unknow what we know, but we can stand firm, we can remember, and we can be ready, ready for whatever might come crawling out of the shadows next. As for me, I'll keep writing, keep searching, keep remembering, because someone has to. Someone has to know the truth, to bear witness to the things that lurk in the dark corners of our world. It's not an easy burden to bear, but it's mine. And in some strange way, I've come to accept it. So if you're out there, if you're reading this, and if you've seen something, something impossible, something terrifying, know that you're not crazy. Know that there are others like you. And know that while the night may be dark and full of terrors, you're not facing it alone. Stay vigilant, stay strong, and whatever you do, don't follow the voices in the night. They just might lead you somewhere you can't come back from. My name is Charles Murphy, and I'm 75 years old. This happened to me on June 14, 2008. I've been a cop in this town for more than two decades, and I've seen my fair share of weird stuff, but nothing quite like this. Our town isn't exactly a bustling metropolis. It's the kind of place where everyone knows your name and your business, whether you like it or not. The biggest crime we usually deal with is the occasional drunk and disorderly or some teenagers getting caught with a six-pack they shouldn't have. But on that fateful night, everything changed. The call came in late, just as I was about to end my shift. 
A woman, frantic, reported strange noises coming from the old abandoned cannery on the edge of town. The cannery had been shut down for years, a rusting hulk on the waterfront, a monument to the town's better days. I grabbed my partner, a young rookie named Devante Keaton, fresh out of the academy. Devante was eager to prove himself, maybe a little too eager. He had that look in his eyes, the one that said he was ready to take down a whole cartel single-handedly. I just hoped he wouldn't get us both killed in the process. We arrived at the cannery, its broken windows like empty eyes staring out at the dark water. The air was thick with the smell of salt and decay. Devante, flashlight in hand, was practically vibrating with excitement. I, on the other hand, felt a knot forming in my gut. This place had always given me the creeps, even in the daylight. The woman who called it in, a Mrs. Pearly Kenwood, was waiting for us by her car, a beat-up old Ford. She was a thin woman, her face etched with worry lines. She told us she'd been walking her dog when she heard the noises, banging, scraping, like someone was moving heavy machinery. Devante and I exchanged a look. The cannery had been abandoned for years. There shouldn't be anyone inside, let alone anyone operating machinery. I told Mrs. Kenwood to wait in her car and keep the doors locked. Devante and I approached the cannery, our flashlights cutting through the darkness. The main entrance was boarded up, but one of the boards had come loose. We slipped through the gap into the cavernous interior of the cannery. The air was thick with dust and the smell of rust. The only sound was the dripping of water from a leaky pipe. This place gives me the creeps, Devante whispered, his voice echoing in the vast space. Just keep your eyes open and your gun closer, I said. We moved slowly through the cannery, our flashlights scanning the shadows. The machinery was silent, covered in a thick layer of dust and grime. It looked like it hadn't been touched in years. We reached the main processing area, a large open space where the fish used to be canned. There was nothing here but empty conveyor belts and rusting machinery. Maybe Mrs. Kenwood was mistaken, Devante said. I was about to agree when I heard it a faint scraping sound coming from the far end of the room. I raised my hand, signaling Devante to stop. We listened, the scraping sound getting louder, closer. It was coming from behind a large metal door, the kind used for industrial freezers. I slowly approached the door, my hand on my gun. I could hear muffled voices now and what sounded like chains. I looked at Devante, my eyes wide. He nodded, his face pale. We both knew this was no ordinary break-in. I took a deep breath and kicked the door open. The scene that greeted us was like something out of a nightmare. The freezer was dimly lit, the cold air biting at our skin. In the center of the room, a man was chained to a metal table, his body covered in blood. He was still alive, but barely. His eyes were wide with terror, his mouth open in a silent scream. Standing over him was another man, tall and thin, with greasy hair and a beard that hadn't been trimmed in weeks. He was wearing a dirty apron, stained with blood. In his hand, he held a butcher knife, its blade gleaming in the dim light. He looked up at us, his eyes cold and empty. He didn't say a word, he just smiled, a slow, chilling smile, and raised the knife. Police! I shouted, drawing my gun. Drop the knife! The man ignored me. He brought the knife down, plunging it into the chained man's chest. The man on the table let out a strangled cry, his body convulsing. I fired. The bullet hit the man in the shoulder, spinning him around. He stumbled back, dropping the knife. He clutched at his wound, his eyes wide with surprise. I ran to the chained man, but it was too late. He was dead, his eyes staring blankly at the ceiling. We cuffed the man and called for backup. As we waited, I couldn't help but stare at the dead man on the table. His face was contorted in a mask of pain and terror his eyes forever frozen in that last moment of horror. Who was he? And who was the man who killed him? And what other horrors were hidden within the walls of this abandoned cannery? Backup arrived, sirens wailing, lights flashing, breaking the stillness of the night. More cops, paramedics, and even the chief, a burly man named Delmar Genret, who looked like he'd rather be anywhere else but here. Delmar surveyed the scene, his face grim. I told him everything, about the call, the noises, the man chained to the table, the brutal murder. 
Delmar listened, his eyes narrowed. He didn't doubt me, not for a second. We'd been partners for years before he got promoted, and he knew I wouldn't make this up. The paramedics checked the dead man, but there was nothing they could do. He was long gone. The man we'd apprehended was taken away in an ambulance, still clutching his wounded shoulder, his face contorted in a mix of pain and defiance. We need to find out who this dead man is, Delmar said, looking down at the body. And who the hell that other guy is? That was easier said than done. The dead man had no identification on him, and the man we'd arrested refused to talk. He just stared at us with those cold, empty eyes, a smirk playing on his lips. We searched the cannery, but found nothing. No clues to the dead man's identity. No evidence of who the other man was or why he'd done this. It was like they'd materialized out of thin air, committed this heinous act, and were ready to vanish back into the shadows. The next few days were a blur of activity. We put out a description of the dead man, hoping someone would recognize him. We ran the fingerprints of the man we'd arrested, but they came back clean. He was a ghost, a phantom with no past, no identity. The media descended on our little town, hungry for a story. The abandoned cannery became a spectacle, a morbid tourist attraction. People drove by, slowing down to gawk at the place where a man had been brutally murdered. Devante was shaken. He'd never seen anything like this, and it had taken a toll on him. He was quiet, withdrawn, his youthful enthusiasm replaced by a haunted look in his eyes. I wasn't doing much better. The image of the dead man, his eyes wide with terror, his body broken, haunted my dreams. I couldn't shake the feeling that we'd only scratched the surface of something much darker, something that went far beyond a single murder in an abandoned cannery. Days turned into weeks, and still we had no answers. The dead man remained unidentified, and the man we'd arrested continued to remain silent, his eyes holding a secret he refused to share. Then one day, we got a break. A woman from a neighboring town called, saying she thought the dead man might be her brother, Owen Swaffer, who had been missing for months. She described a tattoo on his arm, a distinctive design of a snake wrapped around a dagger. We checked the body, and there it was, the tattoo, just as she described it. Finally, we had a name to go with the face. But that was all we had. A name. Owen Swaffer was a drifter, a loner with no fixed address, no family except for his sister. He drifted in and out of our town over the years, doing odd jobs, never staying in one place for too long. The man we'd arrested, the man who killed Owen Swaffer, remained a mystery. He still refused to talk his silence a wall we couldn't break through. One evening, as I was finishing my shift, Delmar called me into his office. He looked tired, his face drawn. We got a call from the state prison, he said. The man we arrested, the one who killed Owen Swaffer, he's dead. I felt a chill run down my spine. Dead? How? Hanged himself in his cell, Delmar said. Used his bed sheets. I sat there, stunned. The man who had taken a life had now taken his own. It was a twisted kind of justice, but it didn't bring Owen Swaffer back. It didn't erase the horror of what had happened in that abandoned cannery. He left a note, Delmar said, handing me a piece of paper. The note was short, scrawled in messy handwriting. It simply said, He was the first, he won't be the last. I stared at the note, my blood running cold. The first? What did that mean? Was there more to this than we knew? Were there other victims out there? Other Owen Swaffers waiting to be found? I looked up at Delmar, my eyes filled with questions. He just shook his head, his face etched with worry. I don't know, Charles, he said, but I have a feeling this is just the beginning. The next few months were a nightmare. We dug into Owen Swaffer's past, trying to find any connection to the man who killed him. We interviewed his sister, his former employers, anyone who had ever known him. But it was like trying to catch smoke. Owen had lived such a transient life that piecing together his movements was nearly impossible. The killer's identity remained a mystery. His fingerprints weren't in any database, and facial recognition software turned up nothing. It was as if he had never existed before the night we found him in that cannery. But the worst was yet to come. Three months after Owen Swaffer's murder, another body was found. This time it was in an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town. The scene was eerily similar, 
a man chained to a table, his body mutilated, the same snake and dagger tattoo on his arm. The town was in a panic. People were locking their doors, afraid to go out at night. The media circus returned bigger than ever. Our little town was now known as the home of a serial killer. We threw everything we had at the case. Every available officer was working overtime. We brought in profilers from the FBI, hoping they could give us some insight into the killer's mind. But we were always one step behind. Over the next year, three more bodies were found. All men, all drifters, all with the same tattoo. Each crime scene was meticulously clean, devoid of any evidence that could lead us to the killer. It was like he was taunting us, showing us what he could do while remaining completely invisible. The toll on the department was immense. Devante quit after the third body was found. He couldn't handle the stress, the constant feeling of failure. I couldn't blame him. There were days when I thought about quitting too, but I couldn't let it go. The image of Owen Swaffer chained to that table in the cannery haunted me. I owed it to him and to all the others to find the person responsible. It was Delmar who finally made the breakthrough. He'd been poring over old case files, looking for any similar cases in the past. And he found something. Twenty years ago, there had been a string of murders in a town about a hundred miles away. The victims were all drifters, all found chained to tables in abandoned buildings. And they all had the same tattoo, a snake wrapped around a dagger. The case had gone cold, the killer never found. But there was one crucial difference between those old murders and our current ones. In the old case, there had been a survivor. His name was Frank Holbrook. He'd been found chained to a table in an old factory, badly injured but alive. He'd managed to escape while the killer was distracted, but he'd never been able to identify his attacker. Delmar and I drove out to see Frank. He was living in a small apartment in the city, a recluse who rarely left his home. When we told him why we were there, the color drained from his face. I thought it was over, he whispered. I thought he was gone. We asked Frank to tell us everything he remembered about his ordeal. Most of it was familiar, the abduction, the chains, the table. But then he told us something that made my blood run cold. He had a son, Frank said. I saw him, a boy, maybe ten years old. He was watching everything. A son. The killer we'd been chasing wasn't the original murderer. He was the child who had grown up watching his father torture and kill. The boy who had learned at his father's knee how to inflict pain, how to take a life. It was a horrifying revelation, but it was also our first real lead. We now had a time frame, a rough age for our killer, and we had a connection to the past that we could trace. The investigation took on a new urgency. We dug into records from 20 years ago, looking for any families that had suddenly left town around the time the original murders stopped. We cross-referenced this with men who would now be in their early 30s. It was painstaking work. But finally, we had a name. Gregory Vance. His father, Robert Vance, had lived in the town where the original murders took place. They'd left suddenly, with no forwarding address, just as the killing stopped. We tracked Gregory to a small house on the edge of our town. It was a nondescript place. The kind of house you'd drive past a thousand times without ever really noticing. But as we approached, weapons drawn, I felt a sense of dread unlike anything I'd ever experienced. The house was empty when we entered, but it was clear someone had left in a hurry. There were dishes in the sink, a half-eaten meal on the table, and in the basement we found our proof. The room was set up just like the scenes we'd found. A metal table with chains, surgical instruments laid out neatly, and on the wall, Photos. Dozens of them, showing men with the snake and dagger tattoo. Some we recognized as our victims. Others we didn't know. Past victims, or perhaps future ones. Gregory Vance was gone, but now we knew who we were looking for. We put out an APB, alerted every law enforcement agency in the country. His face was on every news channel, every newspaper. For weeks there was nothing. No sightings, no new victims. It was like he'd vanished into thin air. And then, just as we were starting to think we'd never find him, we got a call. A state trooper had pulled over a car for speeding. The driver matched Gregory's description. By the time we got there, it was over. Gregory had pulled a gun 
and the trooper had been forced to shoot. As I stood over Gregory's body, I felt a mix of emotions I couldn't quite sort out. Relief that it was over, that there would be no more victims. Frustration that we'd never be able to get the full story, never understand why he did what he did. And a deep, overwhelming sadness for the boy, who had been twisted into this monster by his father's influence. In the end, we identified 17 victims in total, spanning over two decades. 17 lives cut short by a legacy of violence passed from father to son. The case was closed, but the scars it left on our town, and on those of us who had worked it, would never fully heal. I retired not long after that. I'd seen enough darkness to last several lifetimes. But even now, years later, I still think about Owen Swaffer, about Gregory Vance, about all the victims and their families. I think about the thin line between good and evil and how easy it is for a person to slip from one side to the other. And sometimes, on quiet nights when the wind is blowing just right, I swear I can still hear the creaking of rusted machinery from that old cannery, a reminder that even in the most ordinary places, darkness can take root and grow. My name is Richard Hughes, but most folks call me Ben. I'm 72 years old now, and I've always been a bit of an outdoorsman. When I was just a kid, Dad would take me out camping and fishing. I loved it, always did. Now, don't get me wrong, I like the city life too. Grew up in it, still live in one now. I like having everything I need within a five-minute drive. But sometimes, a guy just needs to get away from it all. My buddies back at the office never got it always making jokes about me wanting to live out in the sticks or asking why I'd rather spend my weekend shivering in a tent when I had a nice warm bed at home. Ha! Huh. Like any of them had ever slept outside a day in their lives. This past summer, I was feeling that need to get out strong. I needed the smell of pine needles and campfire smoke. I wanted to hear owls at night and the sound of the creek running over rocks. I told myself that I'd head out to the Black River National Forest up in Missouri. I knew a few good spots for setting up camp back in those woods, places where I could disappear for a couple of days and not see another living soul. I packed my truck with my gear, my trusty old tent, sleeping bag, stove, lantern, everything I needed for a weekend alone. I hit the road right after work on Friday. It was a six-hour drive, but I didn't mind. Sometimes getting there is half the fun, right? I stopped at this roadside grill I knew of, grabbed a burger and a beer. By the time I got deeper into the woods, it was pitch black. Finally, I found my turn off and headed down the old forest road. It was bumpy, full of potholes. The branches whipped against the sides of the truck and the headlights cut through the dust. At last, I reached my clearing. If it weren't for the faint glow of the city lights off in the distance, I'd have been in complete darkness. But the stars, damn. You don't get to see them like that in the city. I stretched my legs and took a deep breath. Yep. This was exactly what I needed. I unpacked the minimum this time, just tent, sleeping bag, and some food. I ate a sandwich and turned in. I was beat from the day and figured I'd get a fire crackling in the morning and have some proper grub. The next day, that's exactly what I did. Got a fire going, cooked some bacon and eggs, washed it down with strong coffee. Pure bliss, let me tell you. After that, I figured I'd do some exploring. It was always fun seeing what kind of stuff I could stumble upon in these woods. Plus, a walk would do me good. Hours went by. Just me strolling through the trees, enjoying the sun on my back. Now, I've been in this forest before, but I never went too far off the familiar paths. I always like the idea of getting a little bit lost, though. Makes you feel like a real adventurer, doesn't it? Well, this time I think I got myself more than a little bit lost. It wasn't long until I didn't recognize a thing. But hey, no big deal. I just backtracked a bit until I recognized the big old oak tree I'd seen earlier. Back at camp, I cooked up some sausages and beans, the good simple stuff. I watched the fire die down to glowing embers and lay in my sleeping bag, staring up at those crazy stars. I was thinking about that funny co-worker of mine, always talking about how camping was like paying to be uncomfortable. Idiot. 
I felt a deep wave of satisfaction wash over me. I'd rather be out here than anywhere else in the world. I fell asleep with a smile on my face. The morning wasn't as bright for some reason, cloudy, a little drizzly. I figured I might pack up and head home a bit early if the weather didn't let up. But before I had a chance to decide, I heard it. At first, it was so faint, I told myself it was my imagination. Kind of a rustling sound, mixed with something else. I sat stock still, listening. My heart was starting to pound a little faster. Then I heard it again, a little louder this time. It sounded like heavy footsteps, snapping branches underfoot. Whatever it was, it was big, and it was coming closer. I froze. Adrenaline kicked in. Maybe it was a bear. I had never seen one out here, but you always hear those stories. I grabbed my axe. Not exactly ideal for a bear attack, but better than nothing. And then, silence. Absolutely nothing. It was like whatever had been out there had just vanished into thin air. I tried to calm myself down. It was probably just some deer or a raccoon. It had to be, right? Still, I kept a tight hold on that axe. Later that afternoon, I was doing the washing up when I heard it again. This time closer, and definitely no deer. It sounded like, God, how do I even describe it? It was bipedal, I know that much. And huge. Every step it took sounded like it would shake the ground. And then there was a grunt. A deep, guttural thing. It sent chills down my spine. My first thought was, get the hell out of here. I could be gone in 15 minutes. Back to the city, safe and sound, before this thing even knew where I was. But the other part of me, the stubborn part, whispered, stay and see what it is. I knew it was stupid, it was reckless. But damn it, curiosity is one hell of a drug. I decided I would stay, just for a bit longer, just to see. I was ready, though. Axe in hand, my senses prickling. My heart was racing like it was trying to jump out of my chest. I saw it later that day. It was moving along the tree line, and for a moment the sun shone through a gap in the branches. Now my dad taught me a thing or two about hunting, so I've seen my fair share of animals. But what I saw in the woods, damn, I don't have a word for it. It was huge, eight feet tall, maybe more, covered head to toe in a matted brownish fur. It had a long, flat face, longer arms than any animal I'd ever seen. But what got to me the most were the hands. They weren't paws, and they weren't human, but they were something like both with long, gnarled fingers. It loped along on its two legs, swinging its arms as it moved. I held my breath, watched it disappear deeper into the trees. It was gone as quickly as it had appeared. After that, the rain came down hard. I figured it was a good sign to pack up and go. I didn't break any speed records, let me tell you. Every cracking twig, every sudden noise had me whirling around looking for it. It was following me at first. I could tell. I kept catching glimpses of movement out of the corner of my eye, just at the edge of the woods. I was nearly back at my truck when I finally saw it again, just standing there among the trees. Still as a statue. Its eyes, I didn't want to think about those. But it was staring right at me. It wasn't threatening. More like it was observing. Like I was its science experiment. Now I'm no coward, but I admit it, I was getting scared. It wasn't until I threw a good-sized rock in its direction that it finally took off. Just vanished into the trees like the first time. I threw my stuff in the truck and got the hell out of there. I didn't stop until I hit that burger joint again. I ordered a double cheeseburger, fries, and the biggest chocolate shake they had. I guess the city boy in me needed a taste of civilization after all that. I drove home in a daze, my mind replaying what I'd seen over and over. When I finally got back to my apartment, I felt a strange mix of relief and unease. The familiar surroundings of my home should have been comforting, but they felt somehow alien after my experience in the woods. That night, I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw that creature, its strange, almost human-like hands, its piercing gaze. I tossed and turned, half convinced I could hear those heavy footsteps outside my window. The next day at work, I was a mess. My colleagues noticed, of course. They joked that maybe I'd had too much fresh air, that city life had made me soft. If only they knew. I couldn't bring myself to tell them what I'd seen. Who would believe me? Hell, I wasn't sure I believed myself. 
Over the next few weeks, I tried to put the incident behind me. I threw myself into work, stayed late at the office, anything to keep my mind occupied. But at night, when the city quieted down, the memories would come flooding back. I started researching, spending hours online looking for any similar accounts. I found stories of Bigfoot sightings, of course, but none of them quite matched what I'd seen. This thing, whatever it was, it wasn't just some hairy humanoid. There was an intelligence in its eyes, a purposefulness to its movements that set it apart. I considered reaching out to local wildlife authorities, but what would I say? That I'd seen some sort of monster in the woods. They'd laugh me out of their office. And a part of me, a part I didn't quite understand, wanted to keep this experience to myself. As time passed, the intensity of the memory began to fade. I started sleeping better, stopped jumping at every little noise outside my window. But I couldn't shake the feeling that my world had fundamentally changed. The line between what I thought was possible and impossible had blurred. I found myself looking at the world differently. Every time I passed a wooded area, I'd scan the tree line, half expecting to see that creature watching me. When I walked through the city park, I'd imagine what it would be like if that thing suddenly appeared among the joggers and dog walkers. The thought both terrified and fascinated me. My friends started to notice a change in me. I became more introspective, more prone to long silences. When they'd invite me out for drinks or to watch the game, I'd often decline, preferring to stay home with my thoughts and my research. One night, about six months after my encounter, I had a vivid dream. I was back in those woods, but this time, I wasn't afraid. The creature was there, standing just at the edge of my campsite. In the dream, I stood up and walked towards it. As I got closer, I could see its eyes more clearly. They were filled with an ancient wisdom, a deep sadness, and something else I couldn't quite place. Understanding? Recognition? I woke up with a start, my heart pounding, but not from fear. That dream marked a turning point for me. I realized that whatever I had encountered out there, it wasn't just some animal. It was something more, something that challenged everything I thought I knew about the world and our place in it. I never did go back to those specific woods. But I didn't stop camping altogether. In fact, I found myself drawn to the wilderness more than ever. I started taking longer trips, venturing into more remote areas. Part of me hoped to catch another glimpse of that creature, or something like it. Another part of me was terrified of that very possibility. My co-workers still poke fun at my outdoor adventures, and I don't blame them. If I told them the real reason behind my newfound passion for exploration, they'd think I'd lost my mind. So I play along, laugh at their jokes about me turning into a mountain man. But sometimes, when it's real late at night and I see shadows moving outside my window, I wonder. I wonder about what else might be out there, hiding just beyond the edges of our understanding. I wonder about that creature, if it's still roaming those woods, if it remembers me the way I remember it. And I wonder, if given the chance, would I want to see it again? The answer changes depending on the day, on my mood, on how secure I'm feeling in my understanding of the world. But deep down, I know the truth. Despite the fear, despite the way it shook my world to its core, a part of me hopes that someday, somehow, our paths will cross again. Because once you've glimpsed something like that, once you've stood face to face with the unknown, how can you ever go back to seeing the world the same way? How can you not want more? So here I am, 72 years old, still venturing out into the wilderness whenever I can. My friends think I'm chasing my youth, trying to recapture some long-gone sense of adventure. But the truth is, I'm chasing something else entirely, something that most people will go their whole lives without ever knowing exists. And you know what? Even if I never see that creature again, even if that one encounter is all I ever get, it was worth it. It opened my eyes to a world of possibilities, to the idea that there's so much more out there than we can ever imagine. And that, my friends, is worth more than all the comfort and security in the world. So the next time you're out in the woods and you hear something moving in the underbrush, something that sounds just a little too big, a little too purposeful to be any animal you know, remember my story. And ask yourself, are you ready to have your world turned upside down?
I've lived in these woods all my life. Not the fancy woods you read about in kids' books. Nothing like that. These woods have teeth. They have a mind of their own. Some days you walk, and the path changes under your feet, like the forest itself is playing games. Other days the quiet just wraps itself around you, thick enough to choke on. But I know them. These woods. I know their sounds, their smells, their rhythm. My P.A., he was a backwards man, too. Taught me which leaves you can eat, which ones will strip the skin off your bones if you ain't careful. He'd say, boy, you gotta respect the woods. They ain't gonna bow to you. You gotta learn to bow to them. So here I am, 40 years in the belly of the beast. I get by okay. I hunt, trap, do a little trading with some folks at the edge of town. Nothing to write home about, but then, well, I ain't much of a letter writer anyway. It started happening about two weeks ago. I found a deer, half-eaten, like something just ripped open its gut and left the rest for the crows. Thought maybe a bear, though nothing I'd seen around these parts before. Bears, they're territorial. They don't turn up overnight where they ain't been. Then it was rabbits. Then it was my hound dog, Ace. Let me tell you, a man forms a bond with a good hunting dog. You live hand and paw out here. To find him, well... Let's just say I ain't slept right since. Whatever it is, it's big, strong, and it's smart, like it's figuring me out. My traps keep getting tricked, but empty. Bait gone. One time I swear the trap was turned around, laid open right there in the path like it was laughing at me. I took to sleeping by shifts, gun by my side even while I dozed. I don't doze so good anymore. It ain't natural, the pressure. Like a string pulled taut, just waiting to snap. That's when things got real. I was up late, stoking the fire. It was one of them still nights, not even the crickets making a peep. And then it hit me. That wasn't right. Too quiet. The silence kinda thickened, like something was out there holding its breath. I grabbed my rifle, eased over to the window, just a little slit between the logs where I could peek out. No moon, just the stars and the firelight making shadows dance on the trees. But I saw it, at the edge of the clearing, taller than a man. Not quite a man, mind you. Fur thick and dark, head misshapen, like a man who'd been smushed and stretched all wrong. Muscle-bound, too, rippling under that mangy fur. Hard to see clear in the darkness. But it felt like it saw me, like those eyes were burning right through the wall. I held my breath. The damned gun felt heavy in my suddenly sweaty hands. Then it moved, it dropped. Dropped to all fours like a big sick dog. Then it shot off, faster than anything I've ever seen. Crashing through the underbrush like it weren't even there. I swear the ground shook. I slept with the rifle across my chest that night. Still do. Don't know what it is out there. Don't know what it wants. But it's got me spooked. My P.A., he told me stories once about things that lived in the dark heart of the woods. Old tales. Mostly meant to scare a kid into behaving, I thought. Now I ain't so sure. The stillness is the worst part. I got no idea when it might strike again. I leave a lantern by the door now, hoping the light keeps it away. Sometimes on those long nights I swear I feel it out there. Watching. Waiting. Heard something the other day? Not close? Not yet at least. Sounded like a scream, but stretched and wrong like a man, but not. Echoed off the hills, sent shivers down my spine. I'm starting to think I ain't alone in these woods no more. Problem is, I might only find out for sure when it's too late. The last few days had been a blur. The sound of that scream still rang in my ears. I tried telling myself an animal made that noise. Bobcat, maybe a mountain lion. But deep down, I know that wasn't right. Nothing in these woods sounded like that. And now, even the bird song had gone silent. I decided it was time to move. Can't stay put and wait for whatever it is to come get me. Gotta take the fight to it somehow. Packed up camp, bare essentials. Rifle, ammo, knife, a little food and water. Can't be weighed down if I have to move fast. Headed into the hills, towards where the scream had come from. Figured that's where it had made its lair. The terrain got rougher as I climbed. The trees grew thicker, older. Their branches twisted and gnarled, reaching out like claws. The air felt heavy, pressing down on me. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves had me spinning around, rifle at the ready. I came across tracks, big tracks, 
Nothing I'd ever seen before. Too big for a bear, shaped all wrong for a mountain lion. They led deeper into the woods, up towards the ridgeline. I followed, my heart pounding so loud I was sure whatever made those tracks could hear it. As I climbed, the mist rolled in. Thick and cold, it clung to everything, turning the world gray and indistinct. Shapes loomed out of the fog, only to resolve themselves into trees or rocks as I got closer. My nerves were shot. Every shadow seemed to move, every sound a potential threat. I found it the next day, a cave. Stank of rotting meat and, well, something else, a sharp, musky smell that made my skin crawl. Left my pack at the entrance. Didn't want nothing slowing me down. Took a deep breath. Stepped inside. It was dark. I could feel the damp stone. Hear the faint echo of water dripping. The stench was stronger in here, nearly overwhelming. I moved slowly, one hand on the wall to guide me, the other clutching my rifle so tight my knuckles ached. I heard movement, a rasping breath right in front of me. Instincts took over. I threw myself back, rifle coming up, fired blind into the darkness. A roar shook the cave, deafening. I scrambled back, hit the cave wall, dropped the rifle. Didn't stop to pick it up. I turned and ran for the entrance, heart pounding fit to burst out of my chest. Sunlight blinded me. I tripped, hit the ground hard, didn't get up. I lay there, chest heaving, the taste of copper in my mouth waiting for it to come drag me back into the darkness. When it didn't, I dared to look back. The cave entrance gaped, black and empty. Had I imagined it all? Had the isolation played tricks on my mind? But when I stumbled back down the hill, hands scraped raw and bleeding, I knew, I knew the truth. That night, I made it back to town. Didn't bother sneaking around this time. Walked right down Main Street, ragged and wild-eyed. Barged into the sheriff's office. They took one look at me, sat me down, gave me coffee, listened. Sheriff Thompson, he never did doubt me. Seen enough out here to know there's things that can't be explained. Heard rumors, too. Whispers about something big in the hills, old stories mostly dismissed. Took a team back to the cave with me the next day. Found my rifle. Found some blood, not human. Matted fur, stinking. Took it all back to the lab folks. They ran their tests. Said the blood and fur didn't match nothing they'd ever seen. Didn't say it couldn't be real, though. News got out. Town's been on edge ever since. Some armed themselves. Some packed up and left. Some didn't change a thing, stubborn as ever. Me, well, I stick around. Not leaving my woods, not now. There's talk of more searches, of hunting it down. I stay out of it, mostly. I know better than to hunt what hunts you. Sometimes at night I still hear it. A distant howl that cuts through the dark. Reminds me of what's out there. Reminds me I'm lucky to still be out here. Folks sometimes ask me what it was. I just shrug. Say I saw something, something big. Some of the old-timers, they nod. Say maybe, just maybe, it's the Bigfoot. Some stories, they just don't die. But I know better. What I saw, what's out there in those woods, it ain't no Bigfoot. It's something worse, something older. Something that don't belong in this world. I've taken to carrying silver bullets now. Old legends say they work against all sorts of evil. Don't know if it's true, but it makes me feel better. I've lined my cabin with salt, too. Another old wives' tale, but these days I'll take any protection I can get. The woods have changed. Or maybe I have. The shadows seem deeper now, the silence more oppressive. I find myself jumping at every sound, peering into the darkness, expecting to see those eyes staring back at me. I've started keeping a journal, writing down everything I see, everything I hear. Partly to keep myself sane, partly so there's a record if, well, if something happens to me. I've sealed up copies in waterproof containers, buried them at marked spots throughout the forest. If I disappear, maybe someone will find them. Maybe they'll understand. Last week I found more tracks, closer to town this time. Whatever it is, it's getting bolder. Or maybe it's just hungry. I reported it to the sheriff, but what can they do? Set up patrols? They wouldn't last a night out here. I've taken to walking the perimeter of town at night, armed, always armed, watching, waiting. The townsfolk, they look at me different now, some with pity, some with fear. They whisper when I pass, call me crazy. Maybe I am, but I know what I saw. I know what's out there. Yesterday I found claw marks on a tree near my cabin, deep gouges in the bark, higher than I could reach. 
A warning? A threat? I don't know. But I'm not backing down. This is my home. These are my woods. I won't be driven out. Tonight, as I sit here writing this, I can feel it. The weight of its gaze, the pressure of its presence. It's out there, just beyond the circle of my lantern light. Waiting. I don't know what it wants. I don't know if it can be stopped. But I know I can't run. Not anymore. So I'll stay. I'll watch. I'll wait. And if it comes for me, well, I'll be ready. These woods have teeth, but so do I. And I aim to use them. The wind's picking up now. The trees are creaking, their branches scraping against my roof. Sounds almost like words, if you listen hard enough. But I know better than to listen too closely to the whispers of the woods. That's how they get you. I check my rifle one more time. Load it with those silver bullets. Set it by the door. The night stretches ahead, long and dark, but I'll keep watch. I have to, because if I don't, who will? So here I sit, in my little cabin in the woods. Surrounded by darkness, by mystery, by threat. But I won't back down, I can't. These woods are a part of me now, for better or worse. And whatever's out there, whatever's watching and waiting, it'll have to go through me first. The lantern flickers, the shadows dance, and somewhere out in the darkness something moves. But I'm ready. Come what may, I'm ready. The smell hit me first, sweet, decaying, like a forgotten fruit bowl left to fester in the summer sun. It wasn't uncommon out here, deep in the Sequoia National Forest. Animals died, things decomposed. You learned to deal with it. But this was different. This was stronger, cloying, thick in the stagnant air. I followed my nose. My ranger instincts kicked in despite the late hour. It was a weekday in late August. The kind of day that stretched on forever. Sun, a relentless hammer on my back. Sweat trickled down my forehead, stinging my eyes. The light started to dim as I ventured further in, the towering redwoods blocking out the last of the day's light. The stench grew stronger, the sweet, cloying smell now laced with something metallic, sharp. I pushed through the undergrowth, heart hammering a frantic rhythm against my ribs. It wasn't something dead, not an animal. I knew that smell. Then I saw it. A crumpled mess of clothes, red staining the green foliage beneath. A human hand, pale and waxy, protruded from the mess, fingers curled into a permanent claw. For a moment I just stood there, the forest silent around me, the weight of what I was looking at pressing down on me. It was a woman's hand, adorned with a simple silver wedding band. My throat tightened. Search and rescue wasn't my favorite part of the job, but it was a necessary evil. I knelt beside the body, careful not to disturb the scene. The woman was young, maybe mid-twenties, blonde hair matted with blood. Her face was a mask of terror, eyes wide open and glazed. Her clothes were ripped and shredded, a single shoe lying a few feet away. There were no signs of struggle, no defensive wounds, just pure, unadulterated terror etched on her face. I pulled out my radio, voice tight as I reported the scene. Dispatch crackled back, calm and professional despite the urgency of my call. They'd send a team up, ETA who knows when. Out here in the middle of nowhere, cell service was a distant dream. I was on my own until then. The metallic tang in the air was stronger now, almost overpowering. I scanned the area, searching for the source. There, partially hidden by a fallen log, was a glint of metal. I approached cautiously, pistol drawn. It was a hunting knife, large and heavy duty, crusted with blood. The kind of knife that could do some serious damage. As I knelt to pick it up, a twig snapped behind me. I spun around, finger tightening on the trigger. There was nothing there. Just dense undergrowth rustling in the evening breeze. I took a deep breath, trying to calm my pounding heart. Probably just a deer, spooked by the sound of my voice. But the feeling of unease wouldn't leave me. The silence was oppressive, broken only by the occasional chirp of an insect. I holstered the knife and took a tentative step back. Then I heard it, a low growl, guttural and primal, that seemed to vibrate through the very ground. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end. It wasn't human, that much was clear. 
It was a sound that sent shivers down my spine, a sound that spoke of something ancient and monstrous. I slowly turned back towards the source of the sound, heart hammering against my ribs. The forest floor was in shadow now, the last light fading from the sky. I squinted, trying to pierce the darkness. There, in the space between two towering redwoods, I saw it. Two glowing red orbs fixed on me. They pulsed with an unnatural light burning into my very soul. The growl came again, closer this time, filled with a bone-chilling hunger. Terror flooded my veins. I didn't know what I was looking at, but I knew one thing. I had to get out of there. I turned and ran, crashing through the undergrowth, the sound of the creature's heavy footfalls pounding behind me. I could hear its ragged breaths, smell its fetid stench. I didn't look back, didn't dare to, just ran, adrenaline a scream in my ears, lungs burning. Ahead I saw a faint sliver of moonlight filtering through the trees, the tree line, my only hope. I burst out of the trees, stumbling into a clearing bathed in pale moonlight. For a moment I just stood there, gasping for breath, chest heaving. Then I saw it, my jeep, parked at the edge of the woods. My heart hammered a frantic rhythm against my ribs as I scrambled into the jeep slamming the door. The engine roared to life, tires spinning in the loose gravel. I didn't look back. Just threw the car into gear and launched myself down the dirt road. The darkness of the forest a looming wall in my rearview mirror. Headlights stabbed through the inky blackness, bouncing off the uneven road. How long I drove I didn't know. Time warped, minutes blurring into hours. Every rustle in the undergrowth, every snap of a twig sent a fresh jolt of terror through me. The trees thinned, giving way to a meadow bathed in the pale glow of dawn. Relief washed over me, so intense it almost made me weak. I pulled over onto the shoulder, gasping for breath. My body ached, adrenaline slowly draining away, leaving behind a bone-deep exhaustion. The sun peeked over the horizon, casting long shadows across the meadow. My hand shook as I fumbled for my radio. It crackled to life with static. This is Ranger Johnson, requesting emergency backup, ten miles south of Sequoia Park entrance near Blackwood Creek. Static hissed back, then a voice, calm but urgent. Copy that, Ranger Johnson. Help is on the way. ETA 10 minutes. Those 10 minutes stretched into an eternity. I sat there, slumped against the steering wheel, replaying the horrifying scene in my mind. The woman's lifeless eyes, the glint of the hunting knife, the unseen creature with its bone-chilling growl. Distant sirens wailed, growing louder by the second. Two park ranger vehicles emerged from a cloud of dust, pulling up beside my jeep. My partner Davies jumped out his face etched with concern. What happened, John? My voice was hoarse. Found a body, woman, mauled, and something else. I trailed off, unable to articulate the terror that still clung to me. Davies took one look at my face and knew I wasn't exaggerating. We secured the area, waiting for the forensics team. The silence was thick, broken only by the chirping of birds and the distant whine of approaching vehicles. The forensics team arrived, a grim-faced group in white overalls. They cordoned off the area, meticulously documenting the scene. I led them to the body, then to where I found the hunting knife. The medical examiner, a woman with steely gray hair, knelt beside the body. She shook her head. Multiple lacerations, but the wounds, they're unlike anything I've ever seen. Deep, ragged, her voice trailed off, a flicker of unease crossing her face. Hours ticked by. The sun climbed higher, turning the meadow into a furnace. The forensics team finished their work, bagging evidence and taking photographs. They loaded the body into a waiting ambulance. Davies and I were the last ones left. What the hell was that thing, John? Davies finally asked, his voice barely a whisper. I looked at him, helpless to answer. No explanation I could offer would make sense. We both knew the truth. There were things out there that defied logic, creatures that lurked in the shadows, unseen and unheard of by most. We returned to the station in a heavy silence. The news of the dead woman spread like wildfire, sending ripples of fear through the small park community. Reporters swarmed the station demanding answers. We gave them platitudes, unfortunate animal attack, investigation underway. They weren't satisfied, but it was all we could offer. Days turned into weeks, 
The investigation yielded nothing. No animal tracks near the body, no signs of a struggle. Just a woman's mangled corpse and a hunting knife. A chilling reminder of the unseen predator. Sleep became a stranger. Every creak of the floorboards, every rustle outside my window, sent a jolt of fear through me. I started carrying my service pistol everywhere, even around the station. Davies noticed, but said nothing. He understood. One afternoon, a grizzled old prospector named Earl wandered into the station. He was a local legend, a man who'd spent most of his life roaming the backcountry. He eyed me with a knowing look. We're still investigating, I said, my voice tight. Earl chuckled, a dry, humorless sound. Ain't much to investigate, son. You won't find no varmint did that. My heart hammered in my chest. Then what was it? Earl leaned closer, his voice dropping to a conspiratorial whisper. They call it Naulito round here. The water spirit. Lives in the deep pools, some say. Comes out at night, preys on the unwary. I stared at him, skepticism warring with the cold dread coiled in my gut. Water spirit? Sounds like a campfire story. Earl snorted. Campfire story? Son, I've seen things in these woods you wouldn't believe. Things older than time itself. He paused, a flicker of fear crossing his face. You ever seen a bear walk on two legs? The memory of a monstrous silhouette glimpsed through the trees flashed in my mind. I swallowed hard. No, sir, can't say I have. There you go, Earl said, a hint of triumph in his voice. There's more out there than meets the eye, son, more than meets the eye. His words echoed in my head for days. Sleep came in fits and starts, haunted by nightmares of unseen predators and blood-curdling growls. Davies noticed, but I brushed it off, claiming exhaustion from the investigation. The forensics report arrived a week later. The medical examiner confirmed the cause of death as multiple lacerations inflicted by a large, sharp object. The report also mentioned a strange residue found on the victim's clothing, a mix of organic and inorganic compounds, unlike anything they'd encountered before. It wasn't much, but it was something. I pored over old park records, searching for anything related to a water spirit or unusual animal attacks. There were a few scattered reports dating back decades, hikers gone missing, strange noises in the night, even a series of blurry photographs allegedly depicting a large serpentine creature in Blackwood Creek. The pictures were blurry, inconclusive at best. Days bled into weeks, the investigation a frustrating dead end. The fear that had gripped me slowly began to recede, replaced by a dull ache of helplessness. Then, one rainy afternoon, a frantic call came over the radio. Another hiker missing near Blackwood Creek. My stomach lurched. Davies and I raced to the scene, a familiar knot of dread tightening in my chest. The rain lashed down, turning the forest floor into a muddy mess. Rescue teams fanned out, searching for any sign of the missing hiker. Hours passed. Hope dwindled with each passing minute. Just as we were about to call off the search for the night, Davies stumbled upon something. A glint of metal caught his eye, half buried in the mud. It was a hunting knife, identical to the one found near the woman's body. Dread washed over me, cold and suffocating. Following a hunch, I led the search party deeper into the woods, towards the heart of Blackwood Creek. The air grew thick and humid, the silence oppressive. We reached a clearing dominated by a large murky pool. Its surface churned restlessly, a dark oily sheen clinging to the water. A primal fear, raw and instinctive, gripped me. Something ancient and monstrous lurked beneath that surface, I was sure of it. Then, a movement, a ripple in the water, followed by a monstrous fin breaking the surface. The creature was unlike anything I had ever seen, a serpentine body as long as a school bus covered in thick, glistening scales. Its head, vaguely reptilian, emerged from the water, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth. Terror froze me in place. I watched, heart hammering against my ribs, as the creature reared out of the water, its massive body dwarfing the surrounding trees. It let out a sound that wasn't quite a roar, a guttural bellow that vibrated through the air. The stench of decay and swamp water assaulted my senses. Panic snapped me out of my stupor. Davies was already running, his face a mask of terror. I followed suit, adrenaline pumping through my veins. 
We crashed through the undergrowth, the creature's bellow echoing behind us. I could hear the thrashing of water, the creature in hot pursuit. Branches whipped at my face, thorns tearing at my clothes. My lungs burned, my legs ached, but I couldn't stop. Not if I wanted to live. Suddenly, the ground gave way beneath my feet. I tumbled down a steep embankment, landing hard on the forest floor. Pain shot through my ankle, a sharp searing sensation. I looked up to see Davies scrambling up the other side of the slope. Fear etched on his face. The creature emerged from the tree line, its massive form blocking out the moonlight. It turned its head towards me, its eyes glinting with an intelligence that chilled me to the bone. Davies screamed, a horrifying high-pitched sound that clawed at the primal fear deep within me. I twisted my head, heart hammering to see the creature lunge for him. Davies scrambled back, but it was too late. The creature's massive jaws clamped around his torso, a sickening crunch echoing through the clearing. Blood erupted, painting the creature's scales a gruesome crimson. Davies thrashed, his muffled screams turning into choked gurgles. The creature lifted him effortlessly, its head whipping back and forth, tearing Davies's body with its razor-sharp teeth. I watched, frozen in a horrifying tableau, as the creature devoured Davies in a frenzy. Bones snapped, flesh tore. The stench of blood and decay filled the air, suffocating me. Finally, there was nothing left of Davies but scraps of clothing and a smear of blood on the creature's maw. It turned its head towards me, a slow, deliberate movement. Those empty sockets, devoid of eyes, seemed to bore into me. Panic ripped through me. I scrambled back, clawing at the loose dirt. But my ankle screamed in protest. I was trapped. The creature opened its massive jaws, revealing a cavernous maw lined with glistening teeth. A guttural bellow erupted from its throat, a sound that vibrated through me to my core. Then it began to slither towards me, its body undulating like a monstrous serpent. I fumbled for my radio, my hands shaking. Help! Blackwood Creek! Ranger Johnson under attack! My voice cracked with fear. Static hissed back a tauntingly cruel reply. The creature was almost upon me. I squeezed my eyes shut, bracing for the inevitable. But it never came. A deafening roar shattered the silence. I opened my eyes a sliver to see a massive shape crash through the trees on the opposite side of the clearing. A grizzly bear, its fur matted and bloody, charged towards the creature, a fearsome snarl contorting its face. The creature turned, surprised. For a moment, the two titans faced each other, a tableau of raw power and primal fury. Then, with a roar that shook the very ground, the bear launched itself at the creature. They collided in a whirlwind of claws and teeth. The bear's weight seemed to momentarily stagger the creature, but it quickly recovered. They grappled, a monstrous dance of violence. The ground churned beneath their thrashing bodies. I watched, a sliver of hope flickering within me. Maybe, just maybe, the bear could drive the creature away. The fight was brutal. The bear raked the creature's side with its claws, leaving deep furrows in its thick scales. The creature retaliated with snapping jaws, tearing chunks of flesh from the bear's massive shoulders. The air grew thick with the stench of blood and animal musk. The sounds of the fight, roars, growls, and sickening thuds, were a terrifying symphony. It seemed to go on forever. Then, with a final earth-shaking bellow, the bear shoved the creature back. The creature stumbled, momentarily off balance. Seizing the opportunity, the bear lunged. Its jaws, the bear's jaws, clamped around the creature's neck, a massive vice, tightening. The creature thrashed, its body writhing in agony. It snapped its jaws at the bear, but it was too late. The bear held on, its grip relentless. Slowly, the creature's struggles weakened, its thrashing subsiding. Finally, with a shudder that went through its entire body, the creature went limp. The bear released its hold, panting heavily. It stood over the lifeless creature for a long moment, then turned and lumbered back into the trees. Silence descended upon the clearing, broken only by my ragged gasps for breath. I stared at the scene before me, my mind struggling to comprehend what I had just witnessed. Slowly I crawled towards Davies's remains, a cold dread settling in my stomach. There was nothing left to recognize, just a pile of bloody rags and shattered bone. Tears welled up in my eyes, blurring my vision. A wave of nausea hit me, and I doubled over, dry heaving. When it passed, I sat there, slumped against a tree, 
the weight of grief and terror pressing down on me. The rangers finally arrived just after sunrise. They found me huddled by Davies's remains, a broken figure. They took me back to the station, a silent shell of the man I once was. In the days that followed, I struggled to make sense of what had happened. The official report labeled it as a bear attack, citing the claw marks on the creature's body as evidence. But I knew the truth. I had seen the impossible with my own eyes. The nightmares came every night, vivid replays of that horrifying encounter. I'd wake up drenched in sweat, the echo of Davy's screams ringing in my ears. I couldn't shake the image of those glowing red orbs, that ancient, malevolent intelligence. I threw myself into research, digging deeper into the legends Earl had mentioned. I found scattered references to similar creatures in Native American folklore, tales of water spirits that lured unsuspecting victims to their doom. But nothing concrete, nothing that could explain what I had seen. Weeks turned into months. I couldn't bring myself to return to active duty. The forest, once a place of solace and beauty, now held only terror for me. I requested a transfer to a desk job, pushing papers and filing reports. My colleagues whispered behind my back, speculating about what had really happened that night. One evening, as I was leaving the station, I found Earl waiting for me in the parking lot. He looked older, more haggard than I remembered. You saw it, didn't you? he asked, his voice a hoarse whisper. I nodded, unable to speak. Earl's eyes filled with a mixture of fear and understanding. It ain't over, son. That thing, it's got kin. And they don't take kindly to being crossed. A chill ran down my spine. What do you mean? I've been hearing things, Earl said, glancing nervously over his shoulder. Strange noises in the night. Folks going missing. It's happening again. I wanted to dismiss his words as the ramblings of a superstitious old man, but I couldn't. Not after what I'd seen. What can we do? I asked, my voice barely audible. Earl shook his head. Don't know if there's anything we can do. Some things, they're older than us, older than this land. Maybe all we can do is warn folks, keep them away from the deep waters. As I drove home that night, Earl's words echoed in my mind. The creature was dead. I had seen it with my own eyes. But what if it wasn't the only one? What if there were more out there, lurking in the dark waters of the forest? I found myself glancing in the rearview mirror more often than necessary, half expecting to see glowing red eyes following me. The shadows seemed deeper, more menacing. Every rustle in the undergrowth, every snap of a twig, sent a jolt of fear through me. That night, as I lay in bed, unable to sleep, I made a decision. I couldn't run from this. I couldn't pretend it hadn't happened. Tomorrow, I would go back to the forest, back to Blackwood Creek. I had to know the truth, had to face my fears. As I drifted off into an uneasy sleep, I could have sworn I heard a faint, guttural growl in the distance, a sound that spoke of ancient hunger and patient malevolence, a sound that whispered of terrors yet to come. The forest held its secrets, and I was determined to uncover them, no matter the cost. But as I stood on the precipice of this dark journey, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was venturing into something far beyond my understanding, something that might very well be the end of me. The creatures of Blackwood Creek were out there, waiting in the shadows, and I had a sinking feeling that our encounter was far from over. It was just the beginning of a nightmare that would consume not just me, but perhaps the entire region. As dawn broke, I packed my gear, my hands shaking slightly as I holstered my gun. Whatever lay ahead, I knew one thing for certain. The horrors I had witnessed in those woods would pale in comparison to what was coming. The true test of survival was just beginning. 